Hey, my name is Matt Johnson, and today I'm gonna to be showing you my fast filmmaking settings for the Sony FX30, which will give you access to all of the settings that you need at your fingertips with very minimal need to dive into the menus. If you film weddings, documentaries, basically anything where you need to be able to shoot very fast, this video is for you. And to start, if you want to save time, you can click the link down in the description to download a file that you can load into your FX30 to immediately start using all these settings. No need to just follow through this entire video. It's completely for free, my gift to you. But of course, if you don't want to download it, keep watching this video because you will hopefully learn a lot about this camera. Now, this video is the first part of a two-part series, and we'll walk you through all of the menus that you need to dial in to get this camera working as fast as possible for filmmaking. I've split it up because going through the menu takes a while. The second video in the series will be comparatively much faster and we'll cover how to set up the camera's custom modes, custom buttons, and function menu so you can access all the camera's most important settings very quickly. You are going to love that video because it will basically keep you from having to dive into the menus 99% of the time. I will link to that video down below. For now, though, we need to talk about the FX30's menu, so grab your FX30 and let's get started. First off, make sure your FX30 is set to video mode by pressing the mode button and navigating to movie. The FX30 will customize the menu depending on if you're in video or photo mode, and because this is a video about the best filmmaking settings for the FX30, the camera does need to be in video mode. Press menu and by default, the camera is gonna to open to the main one menu that is custom to the FX30 and the FX3, which is gonna give you a lot of controls here and has a touch screen. It's really cool. But if you press left twice, you'll see at the very top, we have the my menu section. This is a completely customizable menu that will let you quickly access the settings that you need the most. My next video will cover setting up this menu as well as custom buttons, the custom modes and the function menu. Next, let's start customizing. Move on down to the red camera icon that says shooting, and we're gonna start off with image quality slash recording. For file format, I would select XAVCS 4K, and then for movie settings, I would set a recording frame rate of 24P, and then for record settings, set it to the highest that you can, 100M 422 10-bit. If you wanna know more about the video formats of this camera, I have another video all about the video formats of the Sony A7S III, and all of these video settings from this camera apply to the a7s3 as well so you can watch that video i'll link to it up in the corner and down in the video description also one other note here i prefer xavcs because it's going to give you access to 30p recording but otherwise if you do not use 30p i would recommend switching your file format to xavc hs 4k the reason for this is that HS records in H.265, which is gonna give you a slight, and I mean slight, better image quality. So you can go with that if you want. Next, you have S and Q settings. And I would only access these settings if you want to record in 4K at 120 frames per second in the XAVCS I format. If you don't want to record in that very, very high quality though, I wouldn't use S and Q though because your camera is going to conform your video to slow motion in camera and you're also gonna lose access to your audio. And you always want to be recording audio whenever you're recording, so that's why I don't recommend S and Q. Next we have log shooting settings and this is another exclusive feature for the FX30 and FX3. This setting is gonna turn the FX30 into a log filmmaking beast with the addition of Cine EI mode but that is a completely different way of shooting that is going to require a completely different tutorial. Good news is I'm making a tutorial about it and you can subscribe if you wanna see it. The main thing that you need to know is that your picture profiles are gonna be different now with the FX30. There's no PP8 or PP9 like on older Sony cameras that you would use to access S-Log3. Instead, S-Log3 is enabled via this log shoot setting menu. So if you want your FX30 to act just like the A7S3 or FX3 before the 2.0 firm date, or basically if you want your FX30 to act like any other older Sony camera in regards to S-Log3, you need to go here into the log shooting setting and set it to flexible ISO, which is gonna give you all of the controls that you would normally use when filming an S-Log3. Because I recommend filming an S-Log3, I would recommend selecting flexible ISO now, and for color gamut, make sure it's set to sgamut3.cine slash s-log3. 
Now we have this embed LUT setting and by default it's set to on and you wanna turn that off because this embed LUT file, which spoiler, there's a setting that we're gonna cover in a bit that governs how you can import LUTs into your camera. Once you have those LUTs imported, you have the option to either use the LUTs as an image preview that basically shows you what your footage will look like on the camera screen with your LUT. But once you import the footage into your computer, it will still be flat and gray like you would expect S-Log3 footage to be. With this embed LUT feature though, you can actually have the camera record that S-Log3 footage with your LUT applied, which can save you a ton of time when color grading because you import your footage and it's already color graded. But this does come at the expense of less flexibility in post. And that's the new log shooting settings. Backing on out now, we have proxy settings. These are great for slower computers. I have a tutorial all about them that I will link to in the corner and the description. Highly recommend watching it. Lastly, we have lens compensation. And the first thing you need to know is this is only usable for Sony native lenses. So if you do not have a live lens, if you're using a dead adapter to connect an old vintage lens, all this stuff's gonna be great out here. But if you're using a native Sony lens, you're gonna have settings like shading compensation, chromatic aberration compensation, and distortion compensation. I would leave all these to their defaults, but down here, you're also gonna notice a setting called breathing compensation. If you are using a native Sony lens that is supported and you want to eliminate lens breathing, enable this feature. But be aware that it will crop in your footage a bit though. Subheading through, we're powering through this thing here. Up first, you have format, and that formats the memory card, duh. That's important, you should know where that is. Next, you have recording media settings, and these are super important. For anything that you do not want to ever run the risk of losing, because the FX30 has dual memory card slots, I would always recommend recording to dual SD card slots. So go down here to recording media for video and select simultaneous recording. You can also do it for photo if you want to. And then for auto switch media, make sure that you set this to on. This way, in the event that you only have one memory card in your camera, the camera will still start recording. If you don't have the setting turned on, it's gonna give you an error. Next, you have Recover Image Database. And this is a great feature if your camera memory card ever gets corrupted, use this to help fix that. Next, you have Display Media Info. And this just shows you how much recording time you have left on your camera. It's cool, it's there. I remember on my old Canon 7D, if I wanted to check how much space was left, I actually had to go to the format the card menu, which was terrifying. So I'm glad that you can just do this instead. Subheading three, file. You have the right serial number option. By default, I leave this off, but if you wanna turn it on, it's going to embed the camera's serial number into the metadata of the camera files. That way, if your camera was ever to get lost or stolen, you could be like, no, this person took this video or photos and they had my serial number in it. Yeah, and if you want it, you can turn it on. Next, you have file settings, and this is actually really useful. You can use it to set the file number to series, which is gonna keep the camera counting up the file names even when you format the card. Older Sony cameras would be set to reset, which would reset the file names every time you formatted your card, which could make keeping track of your file names a pain, so I would definitely leave this set to series. Down here for file name format too, you can also change this to standard or date, date plus title, and you can even give your video clips a custom title. So if you were say filming a wedding ceremony with this camera, you could label the files on the memory card ceremony. That way you would be able to know at a glance whenever you're editing, oh, this is the ceremony angle, the files are labeled ceremony. It's pretty cool to be able to do this in camera. Backing on that now, subheading four, we have shooting mode. And by default, you're gonna notice these things are grayed out here, but if we go down here to exposure control type, which is currently set to flexible exposure mode, you're gonna wanna change this to PASM mode, PASM mode. FYI, I would be aware that whenever you select PASM mode, anytime you press the mode button on the camera from here on forward to select your different video camera icon or presets, Whenever you press mode, the camera is going to then pop up and say, do you want to film in PAS or M mode? Um, make sure you always select in. Cool. That's what's important here, because now you go up here and make sure that your exposure mode is set to manual exposure. Believe me, you want manual. Back into the menu here. The reason setting your camera to manual mode is so important is because this is going to enable you to manually change your aperture and shutter speed, and you really want to be able to do that. You don't want your camera doing stuff auto, okay? You want it to be all manual. s and exposure mode will be grayed out because you're already using manual exposure. That's awesome. Then you have this recall camera setting, camera set media, and memory slash recall media. 
you're going to use camera set memory to save your current camera settings as presets for MR1 through MR3. The next video in the series is gonna cover how to do that. And then recall camera settings is gonna be how you can select those files and memory recall media is going to select where you can save some of those presets, but you're not actually gonna use the presets that are saved to the memory card. So yeah, don't worry. Next video is gonna cover all that. Don't stress about these settings. We gotta go on to subheading five. First up, you have silent mode. I wouldn't worry about this. This is for photo, not video. Um, Yeah, you can turn it on if you want, I guess. Why not? Sure, if you're gonna take some photos, you don't wanna move the shutter. Cool, awesome. Release without lens, very important. Make sure this is set to enable, otherwise you're not gonna be able to record with non-native Sony lenses. Your camera's gonna give you an error saying like, there's no lens attached. And you're like, no, there is a lens, I promise. Yeah, make sure that's enabled. Anti-flicker settings. This is actually super useful and helpful. If you're dealing with a lot of flicker from cheap lighting in your shot, you can enable variable shutter, and then you can go to your variable shutter settings, and down here in the bottom left, you'll see it says standby, and it says 64.0. You can change your shutter speed in very, very finely incremented levels, which is gonna be amazing if you are dealing with flicker, because you can really dial it out. I'm gonna turn this off though, because we don't need it right now, but know where that is. Do not worry, we're gonna set a custom setting so you can access this quicker than I'm gonna dive into this menu in the next video. Subheading six, we got audio recording, which you wanna to set to on. Yeah, definitely set audio recording on. You wanna record audio. For audio recording level, by default, it goes to 26. That's a bit loud. I usually go about 15 or so, but if you are noticing things are quiet, bump it up a bit. Next video is gonna have settings to change that quickly. Audio out timing. This is a useful setting to know where it is if you need it. By default, it's set to live and I would leave it to that. But if you're using an external recorder like an Atomos Ninja and you are monitoring your audio with headphones and notice that the audio sounds slightly out of sync, you can change this setting to lip sync, which would make everything sync up between your camera and the monitor and your headphones. And yeah, it'll just, it'll just work. So that's where that is. Next, you get wind noise reduction. By default, this is set to off, and this is gonna apply a low cut filter to the audio recorded in the camera, so it can remove some of that really deep wind noise that you usually get. I usually leave this off because you can always remove the wind noise in post, but if you're hearing a lot of wind noise and you wanna tweak it a little bit and you wanna have to do less editing, turn it on. Multi-interface shoe, what is, what is this last thing? NI shoe audio set? Well, technically that's an M, it's MI stands for multi-interface. If you have a microphone that works with the live hot shoe at the top of this camera, like Sony's XLR K3M or their ECM B1M, this is going to let you change those settings. Good to know where it is in the settings. Next, we got subheading seven, time code settings. Ooh, all these settings are great if you use time code to sync up your audio between your camera and your audio recorder. I don't personally use this though, and so I would only use these settings if you're planning on recording using time code. Great to have them. Subheading eight, image stabilization. Pff, you know this is important, okay? The FX30 has IBIS, AKA in-body image stabilization. By default, it's gonna be set to standard, but I'd bump it up to active, okay? It's gonna give you a slight crop. We were talking like 1.1 times crop, but it's gonna stabilize your footage even more, and it's really, really awesome. Of course, if you're on a tripod, you can leave it off, but for me, 90% of the time, it's on active. Steady shot, adjust, and focal length. These two settings are great if you are needing to use a non-native Sony lens that does not have a live connection to the camera. By default, you can just leave this to auto, but if you set it to manual and you are using a lens that does not have an electronic connection, you need to go in here and dial in the millimeters of the lens that you are using so that way the IBIS can compensate properly. If you do not have this setting right, your footage is gonna look shaky. Like the sensor's gonna be moving more than it should and you're gonna get these weird jitters and it's happened to me. So yeah, make sure that you get that right. Let's leave this back on auto though for now. Cool. We got subheading nine, zoom, and this one is super awesome. So by default, your zoom range is gonna say optical zoom only. Pff, we don't want that, no, you want clear image zoom, which is Sony's proprietary fancy zoom setting that basically enables you to zoom in with the sensor, and it's super cool. So if we hit menu here and go back, the FX30, you'll see here at the top, it has a dial here that you can use to zoom in and out. So we go to the right here, suddenly we're zooming in 1.5 times. What the heck? So cool. Zoom back out again. Yeah, clear image zoom is fantastic. I absolutely love it. It's just, it's just cool. 
Okay, it's just cool. Then we got zoom lever speed. So now we can fine tune this little lever here, lever, lever, that way if you want to dial things in. So you can change the zoom speed whenever you're in standby and the zoom speed whenever you're recording. I would set the first zoom speed to one because you want it to be slow and then make sure you change the first zoom speed for recording as well to one and then leave the other one on fast. So basically the zoom's gonna have two settings. If you barely press the button here, it's gonna just slowly zoom in real dramatic, real romantic-like, like that's a nice slow chill zoom. You could do that, people ain't even gotta notice you're zooming in. But if you slam it all the way where it's like whoop, there you go, zooming in out really fast. So you have the versatility there by setting one setting to one and one setting to eight. Then you also have custom key zoom speed and remote zoom speed. This is if you're gonna set a custom key, but because the FX30 has this little zoom lever, you don't need to worry about custom keys. And then for remote zoom speed, it's if you get a remote and you're like, using a remote with your camera, you ain't gonna do that. If you want to, you can, it's there, but yeah, that's where you access that setting. Subheading 10, we got shooting display. Do you like grid lines? Who doesn't like grid lines? You can do some cool stuff with this. You wanna turn on a rule of thirds grid so you can see what's going on. Square, diagonal and square. I'm a big fan of a rule of thirds grid personally, so you can set this on if you want. I'm gonna leave it off because it can be a little crazy. Next, we have emphasize recording display, and oh my goodness, this is fantastic. Keep in mind, the FX30 Audi has like a light on the front, a light on the top, a light on the back to tell you it's recording, but you can also have the camera set to have a red line around the screen indicating that it is recording as well. I love this, make sure this is enabled, it is fantastic. Subheading 11, we have the marker display. And remember those grid lines that we just talked about? Yeah, this is just like more of those. So you have a lot of really fantastic options here. You can go into the aspect marker and say, hey, I want to have 185 to one or two to 35 to one markers on my screen because I want to do that cool cinematic crop where we shrink in the video and it looks more cinematic because you have to squint more to see it. Yeah, that's cinematic, right? If you want to add those bars, here's where you can do it. This way, you can have those guides so that way you can frame your footage properly. Great to have this feature. It's really cool. Just make sure that if you want to change these aspect markers, make sure you then go up here to marker display and turn it on. Otherwise, they're not going to show up. Oh my goodness, we've made it to the pink exposure slash color section of settings. Starting off, we have auto slow shutter. This is gonna automatically change your shutter speed depending on the brightness of the room. We don't want auto anything. Turn that trash off, gross, ew. Next you have ISO for video, and this is gonna just let you um, change your ISO of the camera. So I've got it set to 800 right now. You wanna crank it up higher? Here's where you can do it in the setting. Do not worry, there's a much faster way to do that. We'll cover that in the next video. So yeah, ISO 800 is there, I would leave it at that. ISO range limit, this basically lets you set a minimum and maximum ISO range for the camera. Just, yeah, leave it at 50 to 102. You don't need to change that. Yeah, you're good. Then you have all these other things here. Base ISO, base ISO switch EI, which uh, stands for exposure index. Then you just have exposure index. What is all this, Matt? What is happening? These settings are all gonna be useful if you're using the Cine EI mode, which, hey, another video about that coming. Subscribe if you wanna see it. Last note down here at the bottom, you have auto slash manual switch set. This is basically gonna enable you to switch between these things if you're using auto, but hey, we're using manual, so who cares? You don't need that. Moving on here, subheading to exposure compensation. This is another auto thing here. You see, you try to select it. It's like valid when set to ISO auto. Pfft. We ain't using ISO auto, nah. Exposure step, 0.3 EV. This is useful if you're changing your exposure. It's gonna let you change it smoother. Um, and then for exposure, uh, STD adjust, you don't want to give your camera STDs, okay? You don't wanna do that, so you don't need this thing. No, for real, um, this thing adjusts the standard of optimum exposure. And the camera's even warning you here, like, this isn't necessary. Like, don't do it. Cool, I won't, awesome. Subheading three, one of my favorite settings in the camera, we have the metering mode. And by default, this is set to multi. And that's what you want because the camera's basically gonna be looking at the entire image that you're recording. It's gonna be saying, hey, I wanna make sure that the exposure is good and balanced for everything in the image. So that's really great. I would leave it on multi 99% of the time. Then you have face priority in multimetering. Basically, the camera's gonna be like, hey, do I see faces? Should I try to prioritize the brightness for those faces whenever I'm metering? Yes, you do want that. Leave that on. Spot metering port. If you want to use spot metering here, which is down here, spot standard, instead of multi, then you can choose this here and you can change it to center or focus point link. Focus point link is cool because then you can tap on your screen and the camera's gonna tell you what the exposure is in that specific part of the screen. 
and that can be really useful if you're trying to expose properly. So you can set that to that if you want. I just kind of leave it on focus point link. And that way, if I ever want to switch over to spot metering, I can do it really quickly and it's already set up for that. Moving on down here then, we have white balance subheading four. By default, white balance is set to auto. Oh, gross. We don't want auto anything. Go on down here. You have some presets here if you want to do like daylight or shade or cloudy, but I personally prefer and recommend you go down here to Kelvin. Yeah, we're dialing in specific numbers here. We're getting really math and science here. But if you go to the right here, you can dial in your Kelvin. By default for daylight, I leave it set to 5,000. And as a bonus for you, if you press the right button here, Ooh, look at this. We have a whole little chart thing here. It's got red, yellow, blue, and pink. So if you were trying to shift the colors of your image, you can go over here and be like, I need more magenta. And the camera's gonna be like, here's a lot of magenta, bro. You want some magenta. So it's a really nice way if you're dealing with some strange color casts in your camera, you can really tweak things very specifically. And I love it. I think it's a really cool feature. It's really great. You can use it if you want to. It's right there, but by default, uh, 5,000 Kelvin, we're just gonna leave it on that. Have your camera set up for daylight, should look really good. Priority set and auto white balance, Pff, auto, you don't need to worry about that, just leave it on standard, that's fine. Shockless white balance, this is super cool. So if you are ever live recording and your camera's recording and you wanna change the white balance while you are recording, you can set your shockless white balance to three, which is slow, which I highly recommend, which is gonna slow down that adjustment of the white balance. So it's gonna be a very smooth shift in the white balance instead of a very sharp shift and can really help from freaking out your audience whenever they're watching the video. Really, really cool, highly recommend that. Down here, we got subheading five, color slash color tone. You got dynamic range optimizer, Pff, leaving that thing off because we're shooting in log, who needs that? Creative look, don't need to worry about that. Profile, picture profile, nope, don't need that because we're shooting in log. If you are not shooting in log, some of these will be accessible. If you wanted to, there's a neutral creative look you could use if you wanted to have all your picture profiles turned off. Or you can go in here and use your picture profiles to access other profiles like PP11, which is s Cinetone. So if you want to access that and not film in log, that's where you can do it. Really cool. Now, down here, we have this select LUT setting. What? So here's where you can add a preview LUT to your S-Log3 footage to see how it looks in post. For example, by default, it's gonna add an S709 LUT, which is a Rec 709 LUT. Basically, it's gonna take your camera footage from being in log format to being super saturated and contrasty. So by default, it's set to that, but if we go up here to S-Log3, we're looking gray and washed out again. Wait a second, yeah. That's where you can access that setting. So you can tweak between these here if you want to. We're gonna set this to a custom button so you can access it really quickly. But if you ever use the Gamma Display Assist feature in older Sony cameras, which is in this camera too, I prefer to do things this way so you can just select X, S709 and you're good to go. You're also gonna notice there's a 709 800% here. What is that about? Um, this is basically a higher contrast version of the regular S709 LUT. And so if you're filming with a bunch of older Sony broadcast cameras and you're trying to make all of your colors match up, then you can use the 709-800. You're probably not gonna do that. Don't worry about it. Just, just leave it at S709. You're good to go. That way you have that little preview, but you can also change the S-Log3 if you want. Super easily accessible right there. Down here, you're gonna see this manage user LUT setting. And pff, what is this? We have import slash edit and you got all these LUTs, yes, so you can use your memory card, you can copy LUTs to your camera, import them here, and then you can go up here to select LUT, scroll down, and you have all these user LUTs that you can select. So, if you wanna do that, you wanna use some LUTs, you wanna get those colors looking good, your own custom colors, you can do that here by managing and importing your LUTs. Subheading six, we got zebras, y'all. Lots and lots of zebras. Zebra display, okay, I wanna turn this to on. I love seeing zebras. Zebras are cool. Actually, you don't want to see them on your camera. But in real life, ever go to the zoo, see some zebras? That's fun. Try not to think about how sad they are in their cages, though, okay? It's very sad. But zebra level, super important. If you are filming in S-Log3, you're going to want to set the zebra level. Go all the way down here to custom one over to lower limit and then set this to 94 plus, which is basically going to make your camera show zebra lines lines on the back of your screen that look like zebras that are gonna tell you when the camera is overexposed. And so by setting your zebras this way, the camera's gonna tell you exactly when they're gonna be overexposed for S-Log3, super helpful. Time to move on to purple. I know some people love purple. Gerald, Gerald loves purple. We're in the autofocus manual focus settings here now. We got focus mode, by default, continuous AF. Yeah, you wanna be continuous 
AF, bro. Yeah, because then it's going to be continuous. If you want, you can set it to manual, but we're going to set it to a custom button later. Don't worry about it. Just leave it at that for now. Autofocus transition speed. This is an interesting setting here. So this is going to change how quickly the camera is going to rack focus from one thing to another whenever it changes focus. I would play around the setting and see what looks good to you. For me, I've found that bringing it down to about three is good. By default, it's five, and that feels a little fast to me. Then you have AF subject shift sensitivity. This is basically how sticky is the autofocus on this camera. If you want your camera to stay focused on someone and not shift even if another person walks into the frame, set this to one. Otherwise, if you want it to shift quickly, set it to five. I think three is a good middle ground. Go with three. You can always change it lower if you feel like the autofocus is too jumpy. You also have autofocus assist setting here. What is this about? Well, this is actually super cool. So if you're filming in autofocus and you're suddenly like, oh crap, like the autofocus is working, but dang it, it's kind of off now and I need it to focus on something else. Turn on autofocus assist and then you can rotate the focus ring while autofocus is enabled and it's going to change the autofocus of the camera. So if your camera is focused on the wrong thing, you can rotate the focus ring and the camera is going to automatically switch to manual focus so that way it's going to be properly in focus. It's just a cool feature. I recommend having it on. It's pretty cool. Next, we have focus area. Oh my gosh, lots of good stuff in here. Focus area by wide, that's what I would leave it to by default. It's gonna give you a nice wide area for the camera to look on what it should focus on. Focus area limits where you can kind of dial it in. You can select other options here that will appear in your settings by default. I just leave all these on, you're good. Focus area color, you can set to white or red. There's no blue. If it was red, white, and blue, it'd be very patriotic, but Sony, not patriotic. You know, they're not an American company, so it makes sense. But I wish there was a blue. Other people want things like like the features of this camera on the A1. No, we need blue in the focus area color. That's what we need. And all those settings in the A1 and the A7S III also. Yeah, do that, Sony, please. Uh, circulating of focus point. This is basically if you set a focus point and you're using your little... Uh, control wheel on the back here to move the focus point around. You can set it to circulate, so it kind of, if it reaches one side, it goes from back to the other side. And eh, you can leave this to do not circulate if you want. You can change it if you want to. Autofocus frame move amount. Basically, this little frame, it's gonna be moving around whenever you're autofocusing. You can set how fine-tuned you want it to move around. Standard's fine, I wouldn't worry about it. You're good. Subheading three, we got face and eye AF, which hey, I'm all about the face and eye autofocus here, especially on this camera, it's fantastic. Make sure that face eye priority is on. So the camera's gonna prioritize focusing on faces and eyes. For face slash eye subject, you can then go in and select if you want it to focus on humans, animals, or birds. That's cool. Uh, by default, I'm usually filming humans, but if you're filming someone else, you can change it here. And there are other settings we're gonna talk about in the next video where you can quickly change between the animal, human, and bird settings if you want to. Subject select setting. This is basically, uh, if you, like I said, you can set up a custom button to switch between these. And if you know you're only gonna be filming humans and animals, pff, who needs birds? Get out of here, birds. Nobody wants to film you. You can uncheck birds if you wanted to. And then the camera will only cycle through human and animal, for example. Leave them all on for now though. Right and left eye select, this is for the eye detect autofocus. If you have a person that's looking at you and you really want it to make sure they're focused on the correct eye, you can set to that. 99.9% .9 of the time I would leave this on auto. Face eye slash frame display, you definitely want this on. This is going to make a nice little white box appear that helps you know exactly what you're focused on. Next you have registered faces priority. The camera has a feature where you can like register faces for it to focus on, and then it will try to focus on only those faces and ignore other faces. Uh, yeah, you can leave it on, it's cool. Like you still have to register the faces, which we're not gonna do in this video because we don't have any faces to register, but that's where that setting is if you wanna do that. Ooh, subheading four now, we have focus map. This is a newer feature in Sony cameras and it's pretty stinking cool. So if you turn it on, and we go out here, what? Look at this, it's all blue. So basically the camera's showing the stuff that doesn't have blue on it, it's saying that it is in focus. The stuff in blue is further away from the plane of focus. The stuff in red or orange is stuff that is closer. Yeah, pretty neat. The autofocus kind of struggling here a little bit, but this is great if you're using manual focus. Uh, if you're using uh, autofocus, leave it off. I wouldn't worry about it. Focus magnifier, it, uh, it magnifies things. Yeah, we're gonna set that to a custom button. Actually, it's already set to a custom button here on the back. Bam, look at that, we're zooming in and out. One thing you'll notice here is that you have to press the focus magnification button, and then you have to press it again to zoom in. It gives you like a little square that you can move around, 
But who wants that? I'm always just like wanting to zoom straight, punch straight in. So if you go down here, make sure focus magnification time is set to no limit. Initial focus magnification, set this from 1.0 to 4.0, and then check it out. Now if we press the focus magnification button, bam, we're closer. Bam, we're further away. Bam, closer. Bam, further away. Just love that. So much better. Like, look at me. It's me. It's not me. It's me. It's not me. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. Moving on down here, we have peaking display, subheading five. So peaking is great if you're using manual focus and you wanna make sure that your shots in focus or not. So you can turn this on if you want to. By default, I usually leave it off because I find it kind of annoying. But if you want to, you can turn it on. You can adjust the level of how intense the effect is and also change the color, which notice here, we have red, white, and blue here for these settings, which is cool. Weird that you don't have it for the little focus box we were talking about. But you also get yellow. Like you want some yellow? You can do some yellow if you want. So whatever colors you want there, it's cool. Oh my goodness, we've made it to subheading five. Playback and playback target. So here, for starting off, we have select playback media. This is basically if you want to playback the video clips on your memory card. Here's you can select which memory card you want to playback the media from. Then you have view mode. So how do you want to view your files? You got date, folder, movie. Yeah, you can look through those. Subheading two, magnification. This is great if you want to zoom in on your images, but guess what? We're doing video. You can't zoom in on a video, not in the camera at least. Forget that, we don't need that. Selection says memo now. You have protect, rating, and rating set. For video, you can't really do any of this stuff. So yeah, ignore all these things. Next, you have delete. This is a thing that you might think is important, but I would actually never recommend using the delete feature to delete any of the images or videos off your camera. Instead, you wanna use the format section of the menu because delete is going to potentially mess with the folder structure of your camera. And I've heard about people having issues with that. So yeah, just never delete things. Only format only after you've copied all your files off, otherwise never delete. There's also this delete pressing twice feature, which you can basically mash the delete button twice, bam, bam, and it'll delete your videos. That's terrifying, leave that turned off. Delete confirm, make sure it's set to cancel first, which in case you ever do accidentally select the delete feature, it won't immediately be like, do you wanna delete? It'll give you a little bit more warning. Yeah, that's good. Subheading five, we have the edit subheading. And the first thing you're gonna see is rotate. And this is gonna let you rotate your photo and video clips in camera. The FX30 has a gyroscope in it. And I've noticed that if you press record before you bring the camera up to shoot, say you're holding your camera at your side and you bring it up, sometimes your clips are gonna be vertical instead of horizontal. That's a bummer. So you can use this rotate feature to rotate your clip back to horizontal before copying it to your computer. It's just a nice little feature to have. Copy and photo capture, don't need to worry about that. But then JPEG, hyph, hif, hef? I'm gonna say hyph. Yeah, H-E-I-F, switch. Uh, this is gonna let you choose if you want the camera to take photos in JPEG or hyph, which to be clear, the camera can record in raw, so you're not really gonna want that, but if you do, Set it to Hyph, that way you can have the better image quality and smaller file size from Hyph instead of JPEG. Hyph, Hef, whatever. Anyways, um, yeah, just turn that on. Next, we have viewing. Continuous playback for interval, play speed, slideshow. Yeah, this is all just slideshow settings. Do you wanna have a slideshow on the back of your camera? Cool, ignore this otherwise. Playback option, last thing here. We've got the image index, display as group, display rotation, focus frame display, image jump setting. All of these settings apply to photo. Don't worry about any of them. Keep on moving here. Smartphone connection. We get the little green world icon. This is your network, okay? This is where you can change all of your settings here. So first up, you have smartphone registration. This is used to connect your phone to your camera. So if you wanna be able to connect your phone to your camera and copy video files from it, as well as control your camera from your phone, this is where you can do it. You can use the smart registration and register your smartphone. And then here's where you can select video clips you want to send. You can select how they've been transferred. And then you have your remote shoot settings down here, which are gonna let you control it, how it's going to use the remote shoot setting feature. A lot of that's for photo, but it's cool. Subheading two, we have FTP transfer, PC remote function. If you want to copy your files with an FTP or use the PC remote or connect your camera to your PC and use it, usually you'd use that in like a photo shoot in like a studio setting. That's where this setting is. 
Bluetooth remote control here. If you got a Bluetooth remote, you want to connect it. There you go. Subheading three, streaming. You have USB streaming. This is super useful and important. If you want to use your FX30 as a really expensive webcam, you can do that. And you go here to USB streaming and select up to 4K at only 15 frames per second. Keep that in mind. They're only giving you 15 FPS. So you probably just want HD 1080p 30. That's probably what I would select there. And you can also set up your camera to record video while streaming. So if you were say on a video chat and you want to just stream a low quality version to your webcam, but still record a high quality version later for you to upload, here's where you can turn that on if you want to. Next, subheading four, we got Wi-Fi. Here's how you can use all of your Wi-Fi settings to connect your camera to Wi-Fi. So that way you can copy files to and from it, etc. There's your settings if you want to use that. Subheading five, Bluetooth. You can turn on Bluetooth. That way you can pair your phone to it. Here's where you can turn that on and access those settings. Wired LAN, yeah, if you want to use, I think it's a USB-C to Ethernet adapter and then have that connected. A lot of people do like sporting events, but you're not going to be using this camera to sporting event. It's not really made for that. It's just another feature Sony included. Next, this is important here, airplane mode under network options. We have all these settings here. Airplane mode is important. Turn that on. That's going to turn off all the radios, can help you get a little bit better battery life, blah, blah, blah. All this is not important. Moving on to the toolbox, the last setting, which also happens to be the largest. We're going to be in here for a bit. Sorry about that. Starting off area slash date. You have your Eng language is English, which you probably set up whenever you first turned on the camera. Area date and time, which you also set up whenever you first turned on the camera, but here's where you can change it if you want to. And the NTSC slash selector. This is important. This setting will dictate what frame rates you have available to you. If your camera only records at up to 100 frames per second, you can then go in here to the setting and check if it is set to PAL. If your camera is set to NTSC, it's going to allow you to record it up to 120 frames per second in 4K. So here's where you can change those settings. If you're in Europe, you're probably going to want to shoot in PAL. If you're in America, you're going to want to shoot in NTSC. Yeah, cool. Subheading two, we have setting reset and save slash load settings. Setting reset, that just resets your camera back to the default settings. If you ever screw things up and you can't figure out how to undo them, just try resetting your settings and just starting over from scratch. That's a good way to do that. Save and load settings. This lets you save and load your camera settings to your memory card. I love this feature. This is where you can load my settings file that I have for download down in the video description for your camera that you can then use to copy them to your camera. Subheading three, we have a lot of customization options here. Custom key settings, function menu settings, different sets for still and movies, display screen settings, all these things are the majority of these we're going to be customizing in the next video. But down here for display, screen display settings, here's where you can change all the settings that appear on your screen whenever you're cycling through. Um, I would leave this just to the default, but if you want to change it, you can. Next, you have record with shutter. Super, super cool feature. I love it. This got big, pretty button right here. By default, you got the record button here, but if you want to use the shutter button, turn this on. I always turn this on. It's great because then I'm like, I'm not doing photo, I'm doing video. Pfft, press the button, it works. So great. Highly recommend turning that on. Down at the very bottom, you're going to notice there's a hidden setting down here. Hidden. Very, very bottom. It says zoom, ring, rotate. If you have a certain Sony power zoom lenses let you change which way you rotate the zoom ring to zoom in and out, you can change that setting here. Subheading for dial customize. So we have even more settings here, custom key and dial settings. By default, I would leave these to what they are set to and not change them. But if you want to change them, say you want to make the back dial here, change your aperture instead of your ISO. You can flip things around here if you want to, to customize your camera. You also have my dial settings. If you use the custom modes of this camera as presets, which we're going to cover in the next video, then this setting will let you customize how your dial works for each of these three presets. I wouldn't recommend using these settings as you're going to want your mode dials to stay the same with every preset. AV slash TV rotate is where you can change which way you rotate the dials on your camera to adjust to things like your aperture and shutter speed. I would leave it on normal, but you can change it if you want. Lock operation parts is cool. If you're ever trying to make sure that your camera settings don't get changed, you can turn this on. And then whenever you hold down the function button on the camera, you can actually lock the mode dial and other things like that. And you can customize what you actually want to have locked. That way you don't accidentally bump it. It's cool. If you want to use it, you can. I wouldn't recommend it. Subheading five, touch operation. Do you want your touch screen to work on your camera? Yes, you do. 
Cool, leave that on. Swipe up is a cool new feature. It lets you access the function menu by swiping up on the bottom of your camera screen. I would show you, but I'm screen recording, so it doesn't let you do it, but leave this on. It's a cool feature. Touch function in shooting. Because I'm screen recording the camera screen, this is grayed out, but I would make sure this is set to touch tracking, so the camera's gonna focus on whatever you tap on and then keep tracking it as it moves. Alternatively though, if you don't want it to track, you can set this to touch focus, but if the subject you're filming moves, the focus is gonna be lost. Subheading six, we have accessibility. The camera gives you a screen reacher, which is a really cool function and useful if you need it. Subheading seven, we have monitor brightness. This is super important here. By default, it's gonna be set to manual and you can dial it in. Set this, change it to sunny weather. You want this thing bright. You want this thing to blind you whenever you look at it. Well, you could change it if you want to. I usually just leave all mine on sunny weather, but if you want to film in a much darker environment, you can turn down the brightness. But if you're outside, sunny weather is gonna make this screen so much easier to see. For display quality, you have the option of standard or high, and you're probably thinking, I want high quality. Yeah, turn it to high. That's only going to uh, change the frame rate of the monitor on the back of the camera and basically just change how quickly it refreshes. This isn't gonna affect your video frame rates at all, don't worry, just your monitor frame rate. And I would keep these on standard because it's gonna help you improve your battery life a little bit. Next you have monitor flip direction. And I love this feature, I wish it was in every single Sony camera. This is very useful if you wanna control whether the screen is upside down or not when you're filming. So by default, if you flip your screen around here, it's gonna go upside down. You now have manual control over those settings. So you can flip it up and down, flip it horizontally. These are great settings, I love them. Subheading eight, you thought we were done, nope. We gotta go all the way to 13 here. Subheading eight though. Time code display, you can change that here. You also have gamma display assist. Remember, we're gonna be using the custom LUTs that are in the camera, so you do not need to use gamma display assist, but if you want to use that instead, because you have older Sony cameras and that's just more familiar to you, you can turn it off or on here, and you can customize what kind of gamma display assist you want here. But yeah, I wouldn't worry about it. I would just leave it set to uh, off right now. Uh, display LUT, this is where you can turn your LUT off or on. I would definitely leave this on and then you can adjust your LUT that you use in the other LUT menu we covered earlier. Remain shoot display, this is for photo, it doesn't matter, leave that off. Auto review, photo, turn that off, who cares, leave it off. Subheading nine, we have power setting options. You have power safe start time. I usually set this to about two minutes, that way your camera turns off if you're not recording, it's not just wasting the battery, but you can turn this off or you can set it higher if you want to. You also have auto power off temperature. And by default, whenever you first power on the camera, it's gonna ask you if you wanna turn this to high. If you were scared, well, don't be scared, okay? Turn this to high because it's gonna keep the camera from overheating. It's gonna make sure that the fan is working to make sure the camera never overheats. Yeah, you want auto power off temperature set to high. Subheading 10, we have volume settings here. This is gonna affect your playback volume from the tiny speaker on the camera or if you're using your headphones, here's where you can change that setting. Four channel audio monitoring. This is great if you're using Sony's XLR K3M adapter. You can record up to four channels of audio with this camera. For run and gun shooting though, you're probably not gonna be using this a lot, so just keep it set to the default channel one, channel two. Audio signals, ugh, this is one of the banes of my existence, okay? If you first turn on your camera and just start using it, every single time, you press record and stop record, it's gonna go doo 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 doo. I hate it. I just hate this feature. I don't even know why they include it. So turn it off, please. Be like one of the first things you turn off. Turn it off. Ugh, it's gross. Subheading 10, we got USB connection mode. So this is where you can change your settings for whenever you are connecting your camera to an external device or to your computer. I would leave it to select when connect. USB LUN setting, leave that set to multi, and then USB power supply, you definitely want that on, which is going to enable you to connect a power bank to your camera and use that to power your camera basically indefinitely. So it's pretty cool, definitely leave that on. Subheading 12, we got external output. So if you're using an external monitor, here's where you can change those settings. HDMI resolution, if you wanna send 4K or 1080p. HDMI output settings here, you can select the output resolution if you wanna output raw or not. Very important. HDMI inflow display, this is super critical here, okay? By having this set to on, it's going to show all of the camera controls that you get. So all the settings at the top of the screen here and at the, well, you can't really see, but at the settings at the top of the screen, at the bottom, all those settings are gonna appear on your external monitor if you have HDMI info display on. If you turn it off, all those settings are gonna disappear. 
and now they're not there anymore. And now the camera menu is on my camera. So we're gonna turn that back on so we can go back to that. Main thing to keep in mind is that if you're using an external recording, you're recording raw to an Atomos, for example. Make sure you have HDMI info display set to off. Otherwise, you're gonna be recording all of these camera settings at the top and the bottom to your video. And that's kind of terrifying. I know someone that has done that before. And they had to film an entire, they filmed an entire wedding like that. And they had to basically figure out how to deliver the wedding film with all those settings on the camera. Terrifying. So yeah, make sure that's set to on only if you want it to be on. Control for HDMI that's gonna allow it to pass through some of the controls to the monitor, for example. Yeah, leave that on. Subheading 13, we made it guys. The last subheading, this is it. Video light mode, it's like if you wanna use a video light on your camera and have it connected electronically, leave that just set to power link, you're not gonna use that. Recording lamp, super important. So you have these tally lights on the front of the camera, you got a light here, you got a light on the back, the recording light lights up, lots and lots of recording lamps on this camera. By default, they're set to all on, but I prefer setting this to only front off, which is gonna turn off this light here on the front, because last thing that you want, especially if you're filming a wedding or just literally anyone, any subject, like what intimidates people? The red light of a camera right in their eye, like, oh, it's a recording. Like every lay person knows that. They know red means recording. It's just burned into everybody's collective memories. So if you want the people that you're interviewing, the people that you're filming, if you want them to be more relaxed, set this to only front off, that way they never see that red light and they don't even know. They're like, what? No, I had no clue. It's useful, super useful. Fan control, I would leave this set to auto unless you're recording in an ultra silent room. The fan on this camera is super quiet so you shouldn't need to worry about it. And yeah, just leave it set to auto, you're good. Sensor cleaning, this is useful because it's gonna help you clean your camera's image sensor. If you want to manually clean your image sensor, use this setting first because it's going to lock the camera's image sensor using the IBIS motors so you can clean it more easily. Pixel mapping. Basically, if your camera ever has an issue with one of the pixels on the sensor, maybe it's a hot pixel or something like that and it's just not changing, this setting will help fix it. I would just leave it alone otherwise and not freak out. Lastly, you have version. This is gonna tell you the firmware version of your camera and lens if it is a native Sony lens. This is useful if you need to update the firmware of the camera and check which version it is on. With that, those are all of the settings that you need to change in the menus to get your FX30 up and running. But Matt, there's so much more to do. There's the custom modes, custom menus, custom buttons, the function menu. Well, don't worry. My next video is gonna cover all of these settings for that, and you're going to love it because once you have your buttons and settings customized, you will basically never need to jump into the maze of menus that we covered in this video again. I love it. So you can click down below to watch the second part of this series, which will walk you through setting up those custom buttons and function menu and custom modes, etc. And don't forget, you can actually skip watching that second video if you choose to download my FX30 settings file. It's completely free and you can load it into your camera and immediately have all of my settings and custom buttons set up. No need to dig through the menus. You can download that file down below. Also, I'm gonna link down below to my A74 memory cards guide video, which is gonna walk you through which memory cards to buy. That video, even though it says it's for the A7 IV, also applies to the FX30 as well because it uses the same memory cards and the same video settings. So super useful to you if you wanna figure out which memory cards you should buy. All right, see you in the next video. Please like and subscribe if this was helpful to you. Thanks so much for watching and have a great day.